Relishing the week, I got two toddlers, August wow. and Israel, a <laughs> lot of work. So yeah, once that Friday comes around, it's like... <laughs> Fair enough. Where are you located? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, where? In Bedside. Nice. We lived in, my wife and I lived in Park Slope for oh. a year and a half, like Outer Slope. Slightly less. That's a very residential area. It was very <laughs> residential is one way to put it. But yeah, it was very, <laughs> it was very residential. Um, but nice, nice. Yeah. Like uh, I was there for work for a year and yeah, it was chill. It was easy, relative. Awesome. Is that a, uh, is that a, a cutout of Herzl behind you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's, um, <laughs> There's this French guy who lives in a lot and he does that. He does these That's uh, cool. like Zionist cutouts. And yeah, in, in the world of cutout art, he's like a big yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> like those 30 guys. Um, so yeah, that's basically, let me introduce myself. Let's do this. Cool. My name is Ashley. I am a writer and I've been in journalism here and there, freelance. Um, I worked for the Tower. I think right around the time we published oh, cool. an essay of yours, um, me okay. and David Hazoni and um, and Ben Kirstein, mm -hmm. and um, I've just kind of like I've lived in Israel for fifteen years. I grew up in the U.S. I went to college in New York and and traveled when I was in my early twenties, and that kind of brought me here. I stayed here and wrote a book of short stories called Tel Aviv Stories, and have just finished a novel and and this is something I do the meaning creator is just because I'm seeing a lot of people just kind of grab their own creative thing and do it you know what mm -hmm. I mean it's like yeah. just all around me and, and people are not asking permission anymore and they're doing these great things each in their own specific way and like a friend of mine here is an amazing coffee roaster and it's like the guy is like psycho for coffee roasting. It's just, he doesn't even like it, but he's like, he's got like an artistic need just to do it. Okay. Um, at, or a novelist, Eshkol Nova, who I interviewed, um, a photographer friend of mine, a quilter, mm. uh, writing teacher has been on. So it's people who are doing creative some things, which is not necessarily sitting down writing haiku. It's creativity <laughs> in its you know, big sense. Yeah. And, and in doing so, they're creating meeting, meaning for people and meaning for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, and I think this is something that you might be speaking to with the theory of enchantment. But for me, I look around, I'm like, okay, clearly we're in crisis. And what yes. can we turn to to get ourselves out of crisis? Meaning is like obvious, the obvious kind of tautological answer is not really saying that much. But the yeah. question for me is how do people create meaning? And and that's why I wanted to launch this series because I want people to see that just like all the other people have appeared so far in the interview series, they could just do it themselves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't have to. I was just looking at your Twitter stream, like those two guys who are doing the reaction videos. Yeah. Music. It's like, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool that they're doing that. Yeah. So, okay. So I'll turn it over to you. I'll, let's, let's start with like a little bit about you, who you are and where you come from and sure. um yeah okay cool um i am chloe hi good to meet you nice to meet i you. am from new orleans originally so moved to new york five years ago so i'm a new new yorker nice. um my, my new my new orleans origin story is probably relevant to how i became a creative being um, I grew up in a very eclectic, some would say, <laughs> um, home. Um, my home was infused with uh, very much a spirit of inquiry and orthodoxy simultaneously. 
So I grew up in a Christian home that took Christianity very seriously, but the form of Christianity that the church I attended and my, that my parents um, are part of is a very non-mainstream form of Christianity. It's, a, it's very similar to Seventh-day Adventists, if you're familiar with that denomination. Mm -hmm. Um, we went to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. We observed Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur instead of Christmas and Easter. And in fact, on Christmas Day and on Easter Day, we spent our days reading the history of those two uh, holidays and how they came to be and like unpacking the mm. origin stories. Wow. So that's, that that's fascinating. Yes. Well, some would say nerdy. But fascinating is a better word. <laughs> um, they go hand no, it's, in hand it's, often. Yeah, it's both. Um, no, it was very good education that I received as a result of that. I, you know, I had a very expansive, um, ironically expansive worldview as a result. And I say ironic because, mm -hmm. again, there's that orthodoxy mm -hmm. to it. I was very strict um, about following to a T the interpretation of mm -hmm. Christianity that, you know, my parents had. Um, but simultaneously, that strict interpretation entailed studying the origins of things. And so that gave me a very cosmopolitan worldview. At a very young age, I was aware of ancient empires, ancient history. Mm. I was very aware of the fact that my presence in New Orleans was not the only thing that existed. <laughs> there were things that came before me. That's helpful. And there would be things that would come after me. So... Um, the presence of history was in my life at a very early age as wow. a result of that. That's amazing. Uh, That's very yeah. rare. Yeah, I've, I'm learning that. <laughs> I'm definitely learning that and I'm seeing sort of the, I'm, I'm, I'm learning in retrospect um, the benefits of that educational experience. Um, what else should you know about me? I mean, as a result of that, I, as a result of that sort of insider outsider, experience that I had with identity because I, you know, was insider in the sense that like I, I identified as a Christian, but I was an outsider and that I did not belong to mainstream Christianity. Um, and simultaneously because of the nature of the way we did rituals, observing a lot of Jewish festivals, I had an insider outsider relationship with the Jewish community as well, which created an awareness of paradox um, which is, you know, well, at some point was my DJ name. Um, I'm not sure mm. I go by that anymore, really. But, <laughs> but yeah, so, so that, that gave me a perception of the world or an ability to see the world in a paradoxical way. Um, mm. And that in, trained in almost, a, in almost a very Jewish sounding way. You know, because I, yeah. I think about my growing up in where I grew up in Philadelphia, Las Vegas, and, you know, mm especially Las Vegas and, and also San Diego I grew up partly because they're not particularly Jewish places. You, you mm -hmm. feel that difference and you feel, you know, you're part of the place because we were, you know, secular people, just like mm -hmm. other secular people, but we knew we were Jewish. So there is that, there was always that and, and the same here in Israel because it's, yeah. you know, I belong here, but I kind of don't, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It definitely, it, it gives you, a, I think, something very observ observative. I think it puts people in a place where they can, where they almost are forced to observe, like your step back. Yeah, you're definitely sort of at a distance. And I think that that also, if you choose to, you can turn that into um, a, a very, like, that, that can be a part of your pro the process by which you become an individual um, because you're thrust into that insider outsider uh perception of the world it sort of forces mm -hmm. you to to be an individual and to be your own person i think um so that that you know influenced me a lot and then i became really heavily involved later on um, in college in the pro-israel space as a result of that original affinity i had for jewish culture um which was initially you know cultivated by my religious upbringing so I read Leon Uris in high school um, by accident. Like my library was like giving away books and those are, there were two books that I happened to pick up that were by Leon Uris. So. What, the which the Exodus and. Actually, none of them were Exodus. Oh, even more. <laughs> one of, yeah. One of them was Mila 18 and the other one was QV7. Huh. Neither of which I've read. 
very good books. I mean, I don't remember. I don't know if they were good books, but they were good. <laughs> they were good at the good time. Um, one was about the war, so I'll get an uprising. I actually forgot what the other one was about, but and then I ended up reading like most of his books after that, including Exodus senior year in college in uh, high school. But by the time I got to college, I switched sophomore year in college. I switched majors from film to international studies because I wanted to focus more on the Israel piece. And so I did Israel advocacy for three and a half years, mm -hmm. learned a lot, failed a lot, succeeded a lot, all the things. <laughs> and um, afterwards, I moved to New York, got a job at the Wall Street Journal, worked on a thesis at the journal on this topic of trying to figure out. First, it was initially how to, how to persuade people to love Israelis. That was actually the initial <laughs> Mm, uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a tough mission. <laughs> that was the initial question, British. and then it was like, <laughs> then it was like, well, how do I get people to love in general? Like, look, because love is a practice and yeah. um, requires a deliberate uh, um, dedication, um, and that became theory of enchantment. So there was a there was a order of operations there for my origin story. In so what, so how, how did you get to whatever theory of enchantment is and and what is it what, what's at the core of it yeah so you know i was doing this thesis paper and i was asking you know how do you get people to learn how to love and then i was like well maybe you have to figure out what people are already in love with and then use that as a conduit to build a framework to teach them how to love. And then I said, well, what are people already in love with? Oh, pop culture. And I was like, oh, there are all these things in pop culture that people seem to gravitate toward in mass. So what if I studied Nike, for example, and I studied Beyonce and I studied Disney films. And what if I tried to figure out there's a common denominator amongst all these influencers and companies I wonder what that would be. And so I did. And then I figured out that the common denominator was that they all created content where their audience saw themselves and their potential reflected in the content. Very much mm -hmm. like Joseph Campbell's hero, Hero's Journey um, archetype playing themselves out in a lot of these brands, mm -hmm. which is why we buy into them. Um, but how did, how did you get to that first question and answer of A, how to get them to love, which I guess that would make that's a bit more natural, but then it seems almost like it doesn't seem so intuitive to jump from that to say, what do they already love? It feels like yeah. that was a creative step, you know, something that probably took some thinking or doing. I think that I was already into comparative literature and I was already into the study. I was probably in the back of my head already into the study of pop culture. Like that was something that was, like I had remembered coming across a song by Drake and Rihanna years before this had happened and like studying the lyrics and noticing that there was something related to human psychology in the lyrics. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I remember English classes in high school having a huge impression upon me. Um, and I, I just remember English classes being more like philosophy classes where we would study these texts by you know, Shakespeare and Nathaniel Hawthorne and all these pr brilliant people. But it wouldn't just be about the content. It would be about, like, how do you apply this content to your life? Mm -hmm. So I suppose that, like, I already was, I already had that training um, to, like, look for patterns in certain things that make up our pop culture. And I don't know, maybe that's what, maybe I just came back to that, you know. Do you think that that's also connected to your upbringing in, in the sense of, you know, that kind of deep interaction with text as, as modeling, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I think yeah. with a lot of people are just like, they would come to a text and be like, it's boring, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Other things. But if you yeah. didn't have that option growing up and this is what you were kind of taught to value. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm sure, it, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I love my upbringing <laughs> from a, from a, intellectual which like oh, almost nobody ever <laughs> says <laughs> you're like I, one person i mean i loved i felt like i loved every aspect of my upbringing but yeah. i love that particular because it was very unique um it's very intellectual tradition to actually think about where things come from and the meaning right. of them and the symbolism 
behind it. That was something I was definitely trained and conditioned to do. So yeah, I think that the seeds of that were definitely in my, in that religious upbringing, so. Right, but I think that's also a misconception about religion is that mm. it's non-questioning or that mm. doubt is not, you know, skepticism and doubt are not part of it. Whereas they're really at the core. Yeah. Is you're well, constantly confronting doubt. And don't tell my parents that because <laughs> ironically, they well, they, I always joke that they, I don't think they realize the extent to which, maybe they do, I don't know. But I don't know that they realized the extent to which they opened up Pandora's box with giving me this tradition because the tradition it is and was a questioning tradition. But what that inevitably meant, inevitably meant was that I would have the license to question what I was taught as well. So it's sort of and the tools. self-updating. Yeah, it's a self-updating thing, right? Um, but yeah, that's that's the beauty. It, that's the paradox because, like I said earlier, it had that orthodoxy, but it also had that inquisitiveness. And the tension between the two, I guess, led to some of the things that I'm doing right now. So going back to the, the, these sort of icons of pop culture, the, your, your, base, your fundamental tenet there is that we love these symbols because they show us uh, the ability to achieve our potential. Yes. And when you were saying, okay, great. So how do I harness that? How do, how do I yeah. leverage that? How do I essentially synthesize this into, well, what was initially, initially was the discovery of that. And then um, in tandem with, you know, I was reading a lot of research books about pop culture at the time. I was reading a book called Enchantment by Guy Kawasaki, the former marketing director of Apple, who defined enchantment as a process by which you delight someone uh, who talked about, you know, how Apple and Steve Jobs did this initially with the design of the Mac and the design of Apple products. And that really spoke to me, but also the concept of enchantment was already embedded in the Disney pantheon. Um, so I just decided to call this process enchantment because it's like almost awakening to the fact of your own existence and the fact of your own potential. And consequently, the fact of the potential of others that are around you. And it's a very enchanting and alluring um, and, and really wonderful in the, in the literal sense of the word, like full of wonder um, experience. So, so yeah, and then, you know, I took that and I basically created a three principle framework on how to try to engender or cultivate enchantment in your interactions with people specifically when you ha had to talk about difficult conversations with people. So like I was talking, I was lecturing on many college campuses about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and it would oftentimes erupt, especially in college days, but oftentimes erupt into just like shouting matches. And I'm obsessed with this idea that you can hack into human psychology. So <laughs> I was just like, but can you design a framework where people are less likely to erupt into shouting matches and more likely to give people the benefit of the doubt and more likely to be generous with their assumptions and to uh, greet each other with like unconditional positive regard. Like, so the three principles were really that I designed around this concept of enchantment were designed to try to do that. And the three principles are treat people like human beings, not political abstractions. Um, if you want to criticize, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy, and root everything you do in love and compassion. Mm -hmm. So I lectured on that for two years on college campuses in America and in Europe, and actually once in South Africa, which was cool. Um, and, you know, people were, people started responding very positively to it number one but number two they were like you know this doesn't just apply to the realm of international studies this applies to interpersonal conflict this applies to social emotional learning in the classroom it applies to so many different things like why don't you consider going out on your own and really going hard <laughs> with the theory of enchantment and enough people told me that i was just like okay and so i did who, that who were those people like friends or colleagues or these were people at my talks like these were people like at the lectures like during the q a they would like say make these comments um also some of my colleagues would say the same thing i was working at the time for a jewish nonprofit, 
formerly known as Jerusalem U, now it's called Open Door Media. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I just kept getting that and I was like, okay. So eventually I decided to go out on my own, started LLC, Theory of Enchantment. Um, and then I turned it into a full course. So that was like when I went on my own, that was when I turned it into like a full 25 lesson course where it's like, okay, we're gonna break down these three principles. When we talk about, you know, treat people like human beings, not political abstractions, there's gonna be an entire section on what does it actually mean to be a human being. We're gonna use pop culture and other rich sources to, to talk about what that means, to talk about the human condition, to talk about the things that every human being has to go through, regardless of, you know, skin color or socioeconomic status or other immutable characteristics. We're gonna talk about vulnerability, we're gonna talk about mortality, we're gonna talk about imperfection. Like how do we actually become content enough with ourselves, given that we all have to deal with this. Um, because what I kept noticing in terms of a pattern that produces not love, but I would say extremism, was it was a very, very repeatable pattern. It was insecurity combined with self-contempt, combined with overcompensation for that, or for those two things that led to extremism. So it's like, okay, to work backwards, what we need here is a practice that can teach people to actually love themselves <laughs> so that these other things don't manifest themselves later on in very negative so, ways. So say that again, it's insecurity. Yeah, it's insecurity. Combined with? Self-contempt. Self-contempt. What meaning, with, meaning what? Because we hear a lot of, about self-hatred, self love. Yeah. What's self-contempt? It's the same thing. It's it's like the it's like self-loathing. It's it's a it's um it's really a dislike of oneself because of that insecurity. So it's like one leads to another. It's not that it necessarily leads to another, but in the case of extremism, it leads to um to another. And so the product is just, is is necessarily extremism, or when there is extremism, those two factors are involved. The main important factor that synthesizes or catalyzes those two things into extremism is overcompensation mm. so it's when you when you are feeling those two things and that's a that's a crisis of meaning and then you need to let's let's take a very easy example of like gang life right like if if you are living in a home where let's say your father walked out on the family so now you're dealing with issues of fatherlessness you're thinking oh why does my father not care about me enough um to to leave me all of a sudden like am i not good enough am i not do i not belong am i not you know worthy of his time so that insecurity the insecurity piece is the father leaving and mm -hmm. then the self-contempt piece is where the mind begins to think i'm not good good enough i'm not worthy enough i'm not blank enough and then the overcompensation is when a person gravitates toward a place or a group that's going to give them a sense of belonging and a sense of meaning. And for many, that's the gang life, mm -hmm. um, which is populated with other people who, are, who have experienced that same insecurity. Uh, and, and, and power, I imagine that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it, is, it is power in the sense that it gives you, if it fills the void, Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a sense of security, right? It's false security, but it does give you that sense of security. Um, and, you know, gang, gang um, what would you call it, mentality is on the spectrum of extremism. But a lot of studies show, for example, that, like, the people who gravitate towards um, gang life and the people who gravitate towards, let's say, white nationalist movements are dealing fundamentally with the same psychological issues Mm -hmm. um so so yeah so i say all that to say theory of enchantment is like okay how do we <laughs> try to thwart this process you know um and build a sense of inner contentment security um within human beings so that they don't feel the need to gravitate toward these other organizations and things like that so the i mean the pop culture things really cool because yeah. it's like exactly what you intended, which is that you're kind of using the gravitational pull, the attractiveness of pop yeah. culture, that energy that we love um, to get people to tap into something else inside themselves. But the, the question I have about it is, especially for someone with a, with a religious background or upbringing, 
how do you square it with the materialism of pop culture? Because at the end of the day, pop culture is wonderful if it's in addition to something else. But, yeah. you know, in, in and of itself, it's materialist and it's consumerist, obviously. And it's, um, you know, vain as uh, vanity of vanities, Ecclesiastes would say. So how do you, how do you find something fundamental inside of pop culture to be based? Well, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't think that I'm, it's possible that you and I are defining pop culture differently. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I, I consider the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, Kohelet to be a part of pop culture. Um, it is popular and it is a part of our culture. So I mean pop culture in a very basic sense, um, not in a, you know, uh, not in a necessarily consumerist sense, right? So there's the Lion King in the theory of enchantment, but there's also stoicism in the theory of enchantment. And in fact, I argue quite persuasively, I think that the Lion King <laughs> is super popular because it contains stoic teachings. Mm -hmm. um, and my theory is that if we, cons if we, if we argue that there are certain ideas that are timeless, then we should expect to find them in contemporary form. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm just doing and when it comes to like certain things that, that I think have the veneer of merely being consumerist, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm pulling back, back the layers and I'm saying, actually, there's something far more deep about our gravitational pull toward this and it is not merely vain. Mm -hmm. um, and those things that do, we, we do gravitate toward because of vanity or because of you know uh, selfish reasons are not going to stand the test of time, um, mm -hmm. but I do think like vi like video films like The Lion King will, for example, uh, <laughs> because they contain timeless virtues um, and timeless ideas about how to navigate being a human being and how to navigate the difficulty and the frailty of life. Um, so I don't know if that's a sufficient answer, but yeah, no, it's a it's a great point and. Um you know, it makes me think about Nike because when I, as simple, simple and almost seemingly simplistic as the slogan is, just do it. Yeah. The more you think about it, the more you're like, that is absolutely brilliant. You know what yeah. I mean? Like before that existed, <laughs> yeah. no one was, be, no one was just like, just do it as an aspirational thing. It may be a yeah. command or something, but the moment he, he grabbed that idea, yeah. it's like, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe the rest of the Nike magic, the, the greatness of the shoes and everything else flowed from that, the bigness of the idea. It's not like a big bang. Yeah, I think also, first of all, I think 100% it did. I think, and also that's the moment that Nike became, in the eyes of many, quite frankly, a religion. There's a reason, there's a reason why, you know, you have these people who call themselves shoe heads and want to collect as many, you know, new releases of Nikes as possible. And it's not, strictly materialist it's like mm -hmm. a talisman it's like a, it's a very yeah. religious uh thing um or it's re very much drawing from re the religious impulse within human beings much more than it, and it happens to be that it's a materialistic representation right um but it's a brilliant uh it, it reflects a brilliant insight into human nature um and also everyone i think should read shoe dog which is a great book that explains the you know, how okay. Phil Knight did. I'll order that one. How he created Nike. But uh, it's, it, I read it in four hours. It's so good. Wow. It's a real page turner. Um, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. So where do you go from here with your enchantment? Like what's what's your what's your vision and where are you now in that in pursuing yeah. it? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, you know, Theory of Enchantment is a full course, full training. We sell to three different cohorts. We sell to individuals. So if you're an individual, you can enroll in the course and, you know, do it yourself if you'd like. Um, we sell to high schools as well, a uh, social mm -hmm. emotional learning program for teenagers. And we sell to companies, professional development training, offering uh, an approach to diversity and inclusion that's rooted in developmental psychology. Again, that's rooted in that psychological understanding of where racism comes from. Um, and also that's, that's much more holistic than a lot of the offerings that exist right now. Um, so, you know, right now we're just trying to build, scale, um, really focusing primarily, I mean, it, like I said, those three 
categories or cohorts can buy it. But mm -hmm. I'm really focusing right now on getting individual and the company sales up because the high school, the, the school market, so to speak, is so fractured in America. It's even more fractured now because of the pandemic. Um, so it's just a challenge to be able to, to deliver that in a scalable way. But mm -hmm. um, right now I'm focusing primarily on individuals and, and companies to get this training. It's also, you know, it's a long-term ongoing sort of educational experience. It's not your typical, for companies at least, it's not your typical, you know, I come in and do a two day workshop. Mm -hmm. I could do that, but I also will. <laughs> what that comes with is this intensive 25 lesson course that you should um, deploy to your teams to give them the necessary skills to not only make the culture better, but just have a better relationship with themselves and show up as, um, you know, I think self starters more and, and wanting to make the company greater. So. Cool. And um, what is life like for you right now in New York City? Or in <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like I feel like I you know when you watch like those shows about startups, like or or those those origin stories about Steve Jobs and stuff like mm. that. I feel like I'm now entering into that <laughs> that phase okay. in, what way? in my life. Like I have a you know I have like a whiteboard in my room now. You know it's <laughs> like it's like. It's like really okay startup life you know with all the trappings that that comes with so yeah i don't know that doesn't i don't know if that sounds romantic or not but i'm well, just it, really it's probably best that it is i mean yeah yeah no definitely definitely it's 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 a good thing that i enjoy what i do yeah. <laughs> um but yeah no i'm just like I, i'm really just focusing on trying to build theory of enchantment so that's what life is like right now in new york i mean you know obviously Going to Manhattan, Manhattan is a little bit kind of a ghost town. I've been reading all these mm -hmm. pieces in the Times about like how businesses are shuttering and it's really yeah. depressing. And I want you know, the property values are going down, people are moving to the suburbs. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering about, I mean, I know New York will come back, it's, like yeah. it's, yeah. but like the question is, like, what's the timeline? <laughs> you know, I actually have no idea given yeah. the cascading effect of all of these like brand name businesses closing and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, as well as mom and pop shops. So, um, so I don't know, we'll see what happens in New York, but I'm definitely planning on staying for a very long time and, you know, building theory of enchantment now. So where do you, where do you go book shopping in New York city or where did you? Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would go to strand, mm -hmm. you know, which is like their classic. Of course. Mecca. But I would usually, but I would usually honestly just order books online because Amazon. I have to, I'm a pretty, if there's one addiction that I have, it's that, it's to books. So, um, yeah, I get you. You know, like I, I actually had to make myself a note this month to not order any books this month. <laughs> that's how, that's well, how that's bad the it thing, is. Because you're, you, you live in the US and Amazon, like we, my wife and I talk about this, we're like, imagine just being able to get a book in two days Any book <laughs> for us it's like this yeah. thing like it takes three weeks it doesn't show up. it takes three weeks yeah because amazon doesn't ship here well they do but it's expensive oh. and the books don't ship here so then you have to use book depository which is slower and then israel's postal system is like teetering on the brink so it just oh. it's chaotic so you but on the other side of it because i would also just be like just gluttonous you know and it would just yeah. <laughs> like my house is just yeah. overflowing so it's good actually it's a filter. Yeah. like i really need to want that book to go through <laughs> the thing is though also with me like like theory of enchantment is such a such an ongoing educational project that it almost requires that i constantly mm -hmm. be reading and i am like i'm reading like four books right now but what are they I'm reading The Brothers Karmazov by Dostoevsky, Ooh, nice. which is pretty awesome yeah. and really funny. I didn't expect it to be funny, but it's funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading, because I just read Crime and Punishment, and Crime and Punishment was not funny. But not this one funny. is funny. Not a funny book, yeah. Um, I'm reading Transcend by Scott Barry Kaufman, which is about the, psycho the, the psychological observations of Abraham Maslow and mm. his hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. I'm reading... 
the lean startup mm -hmm. i forgot the name of the author but yeah eric reese yeah yeah we used yeah. to i used to represent him in the what PR yeah small world yeah we represented that book in the pr that's firm crazy firm editorial director uh yeah yeah that's that's so what a coincidence yeah <laughs> so random um and what's the fourth one i'm reading i'm reading a really depressing book about aside from brothers Caramelton. i don't find that book depressing at all actually um i don't think it's depressing you thought you thought it was depressing um i did don't find tell it... me what happened by the way <laughs> no no uh, even if i wanted to i actually i couldn't but um i think it was it, yeah it was hard it was um, yeah. you know existentially hard you're just like okay <laughs> I find it very funny. I also think I know where, where it's going, so maybe that's why I don't find it depressing. Mm. Um, but there's a book I'm reading by Alice Miller, who's a famous child psychologist who argued that child rearing practices, um, certainly in the in the like 20th century, were heinous <laughs> and were also responsible for some of the world's or for helping to create the conditions in which some of the most brutal dictators. Huh. Rose to power. Whoa. Yeah. That's oh, it's called it's called For Your Own Good. <laughs> so Wow. Yeah. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. And probably very true. Whatever Stalin's mama did to him. Yeah. Could have been Stalin, his. Hitler, like a lot of them were like 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 almost beaten within an inch of their lives when they were oh like my God. 11 years old or whatever. yeah so crazy yeah Oof. all right well, <laughs> <laughs> on that note <laughs> so those are the four books that I, those are the four books that I'm, i can I'm see the, right the one the one title i can make out on your shelf is i i think it's almost a lawns herzl above your left shoulder other direction yeah herzl um I don't know, but is this, is my room, this is my roommate's. Uh, oh, it's your roommate's. Okay. So we're very, we're very, uh, we like reading in this household. <laughs> as you can That's see. the way to go. Yeah. The way so. to go. Well, um, this is great. This is interesting. Do you, is there anything else you want to, to share? I saw like, you got a podcast. Oh, yeah. Talk a little about that. So, I mean, I'm working on a bunch of things. We can also talk about music if you want, because I also do music production. Yeah, um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, side note, pod, we just came out, me and my friend Jamie Kilstein just came out with a new podcast today called So Much Things to Say. Congrats. Yes, it's dramatically incorrect. Thank you. Yes, it's dramatically incorrect. We actually named it after uh, Bob Marley's song, So Much Things to Say. So, um, Which song is that? <laughs> Look it up, check okay. it out. Um, huh. uh, when, I think when you'll hear it, you'll be like, oh yeah. Um, but it's basically a podcast where we talk about everything going on in the world um, and in particular in America. And, but we also have like a very artistic uh, approach to how we talk about everything. And, and art and spirituality are like massive components of the podcast. Mm. So cool. Um, check sounds, it out. Sounds really cool. Yeah, it's I pretty gonna be pretty good. So. And music. Yeah, so I started producing music last year. Really love it. Meaning what? Meaning I would, you know, last year I produced, I don't know, a total of maybe 12 songs, put it out on uh, uh, SoundCloud. And then this year I put like, I think like seven or eight of the best into one album and published it on Spotify. So if you actually go to Spotify, mm -hmm. you can find, find my music under my name, Chloe Valdery um so name of the album say, when you say producing you don't you don't mean like for a third party you mean like no no self you're the music <laughs> yeah 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 you're, you're you're making music yeah yeah yeah. is that the right word am i using the right word or the uh, wrong word i would say I, I don't know but okay i would say making okay so i'm making music i started making music last year <laughs> as of now <laughs> I started making music last year. I had an album out on, on Spotify um, called Paradox. Oh, cool. Okay. So, so and how do you, what, where do you put that, place that, that type of music, your sound, what are your influences? Oh, how did you get to that, to, 
to this. This is a pretty big, I'm... pretty big thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, it started like two years ago, or two and a half years ago, when I was, I've been obsessed with this uh, singer songwriter guitarist named Ben Howard out of the UK since I was in high school. And two and a half years ago, I was watching Netflix and I was just like, I need to learn guitar. Like, why am I spending <laughs> my summers watching Netflix instead of learning guitar? Like, this isn't ridiculous. So I decided to buy my best friend's guitar for 50 bucks because she wasn't using it. And I like learned basic guitar. So that's where it started. And then, you know, just had fun with that and just started producing songs on um, GarageBand initially, um, which don't underestimate GarageBand people. Steve Jobs specifically designed it to be a free music making piece of software so that people could easily make music at any time. So I, I, would, I would never there. underestimate anything. <laughs> I'm Steve yeah. Jobs. Yeah, like it's, it can do some serious things. Um, so I initially started producing making music on GarageBand, you know, I bought a simple recorder with two mics from uh, Guitar Center um, and GarageBand has beats built in so you can really compose a song. Um, I started with that and then I later on graduated to Logic, so I finally bought Logic, um, which is like a more expensive GarageBand, um, but the same interface and, you know, started, started uh, experimenting with that and, you know, it's just vocals and sounds and you know and I'm, I'm really proud of what i've what i've produced so far i have this real serious fantasy to one day perform concerts um putting that out in the universe like i really want awesome. to do that when covid is over uh so so yeah i, I enjoy it. it's a very meditative experience for me um so yeah sweet well once you start it come perform in israel i know oh yeah oh my god you imagine when I perform in Israel, it's going to be insane. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be wild. It's going to be wild. Because, like, Israel's, like, it's my, that's my heart and soul in many, many ways. So, yeah, it's going to be. I plan on I plan on performing in Israel, like, after I've gotten really popular. And so it's, like, a big deal once I go to Israel, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you could also go the other way around and, like, win, win over their hearts here, you know? That's and true. Keep coming back and be like, oh, she's still... Yeah, that's she's famous true. and she's still coming back. That's it's just expensive to fly to Israel, so <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I have to work out those details logistically, but but yeah, wow. no, I I would love to perform there one day. So uh, so yalla, as we say. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I would say also one last thing that my one of my biggest influences in music is Sade. Like I grew up l listening to Sade. I think her style is so cool. And it, it definitely influenced. And it's funny because someone actually listened to a song on my album and he was like, are you influenced by Sade? And I was like, you're the first person to, to get that. So, because you wow. asked me what my influences were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, that's great. And it's also great to know your influences because then yeah. it's, it's respectful. It gives you direction and it, and it differentiates you because you're aware. Yeah. I think that's really important. Do you think that there are a lot of artists that aren't aware of their influences? Tons. Interesting. I think the good ones are aware. I think the great ones yeah. are for sure aware and they're like in awe of yeah. the influencers. Um, and I think a lot of people in the middle, I, I think actually, I forget who said it. It was a book on writing that I read, um, a well-known author, a woman, um, and she's saying the reason you need to read so much as a writer is because you, you will, even without reading those other authors, you'll mimic their style because their style's in the culture. You just won't know uh, it. She's saying when you, when you read their work, even though writers be like, well, I don't want to start to sound like this author or that author, but it's the opposite. She says that because you're familiar with their style, you can recognize it when it pops up in your own work and be like, oh, okay. Uh, so that was a great point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also think that, like, to reiterate, it's important to reiterate your earlier advice, which is, like, if you're an artist and you're having, like, imposter syndrome. Like, the first song I made was a song called Imposter, which hmm. was an attempt cool. to, like, deal with and challenge my imposter syndrome, you know, head on. So I it's, think artists I, need I, to... Yeah, it's tough. I don't know that it ever really goes away. Um, 
Well, it's interesting because anytime I tell people I have imposter syndrome, they're like, but do you really? Because it doesn't sound like that that's what that is. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Uh, I think the nervousness is always there, but it's, yes. a, it's like a muscle. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a muscle that you keep exercising and the more you exercise it, the less intense it becomes. I think that's- Yeah, for sure. That, that's something I actually had a great um, interview with Hugh Jackman mm. in Tim, with Tim Ferriss. And he talks about that. He just mentions it casually, the nervousness of going on stage and how, like how he's just coping yeah. with this nerve, or, or actually talked about it going on TV. He's like, you have oh. all that, that being so nervous and like, oh, wow, this guy who's been acting for 30 years, he's like a mega star, is yeah. still nervous. And of course he is. And just like every author before, I remember we, we at the PR firm where I work, we bring in big name authors and journalists. And once it was Ann Coulter, just because she's like such a huge profile, which is like, yeah. who's this person? So yeah. she came and talked to us and she was about to release a book and she was like, she wasn't just saying she was scared it was gonna bomb. She was like living that fear. You know oh, what I mean? Wow. And this is a yeah. woman who's probably sold how many million copies, who knows? Yeah. And has got like a machine and a mechanism and she was terrified. Wow. And I think it's just part of being a pro. A person, yeah. A, per a person, but the pro, <laughs> because the pro continues to face it and get yeah. past it whereas the amateur doesn't and the amateur just yeah, yeah, yeah. guys away be like no it's not i don't want, i don't want to feel that yeah and it sucks because there's so much life to be lived <laughs> you know yeah. beyond the fear of of nerves and things like that yeah so yes yeah, yeah i encourage i encourage artists to be courageous and just do it as nike it, it, says, there you, you know? go bring it bring it back that's yeah. 100 percent it and and i think for people to understand just like what you did with the guitar you mm -hmm. start you pick up the guitar and learn basic guitar you know what yeah. I mean? you're not becoming eric Clapton. that yeah like, <laughs> like maybe in 20 years that, you, not even in 20 years yeah <laughs> maybe never you know maybe maybe one day maybe 50 yeah. years you'll be eric yeah Clapton if you just but i think what people miss is that the, the constant drip, 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 yeah. drip, drip, drip. It doesn't have, you don't need to have a flood of time or energy, just. Yeah. That. Anyways, thank you so much. This was great. You're, what you're doing is awesome. And thank you. I'm gonna listen to your music and I'm going to, um, I hope I could embed, embed a song in the interview. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, text. That'd be um, really cool. And, and yeah, I would love to keep talking. If I can ever help you with anything, if you're thinking about whatever it is, brand, media, advice, whatever, I've been doing that sort of things for 10, 15 years. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'll definitely I reach will, out. If you have um, a headshot and mm -hmm. any kind of imagery, like theory of enchantment imagery, um, oh, okay. anything you have just makes it look great. And um, yeah. Okay, awesome. I'll get that to you. Thank, thank you, you for inviting so it me was, to your it show. It was really nice to finally meet you after all these years of reading you. <laughs> Likewise, Ashley. I appreciate it. All right, Kelly. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye.